Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Henry Garrett. I just retired this actually one year ago today from JPL. Uh, you can reach me nowadays at my email up there. Uh, Insu Jun and I will be presenting on the JPL uh, Uranus uh, radiation model today for you. And so let's get started. This is a out rough outline of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to give a quick overview of the Uranian environment. I'll talk about the two data components of the model, mainly the magnetic field and the particle data. Then I'll give some sample results and some contour plots. And I have a little movie to show you what the, uh, uh, what the radiation belts look like in real time. So it, it unfortunately has made people sick <laughs> watching it because it really goes in and out. And then I'll conclude with a discussion of what the model is useful for and uh, give some uh, examples of the data. Insu will be talking about how you can get to the model online. And uh, also uh, for you, you who are interested, I provided uh, Jody with the uh, uh, JPL formal report on the model if you're interested in getting a copy or a copy of the view graphs. So I don't think I need to go over this too much, but the main reason why we're interested in my is because APL needs to do mission requirement planning and radiation belt, of course, is a potentially important part of that. But uh, as you know, the decadal survey is recommended that, you're, that a trip to Uranus be the next big mission. So here's the issues. First of all, uh, it turns out that Uranus is tipped almost 90 degrees on its axis, as we all well know. And this is the magnetic axis is all 60 degrees off of that and displaced three tenths of a, a Uranian uh, uh, radius along the Z axis. So it's pretty well screwed up if you want to think of it. And to make matters worse, the because it slightly over tilted, there's a big controversy over which way we should count the spin direction for the planet. And further, we don't really know the rotation rate. And we needed to know it very accurately to be able to make our model work today if to be of any accuracy. The bottom line is that going into Uranus, we thought the spin rate was 15.57 hours. We came out thinking it's 17.24. And you can see any, since 1982, when we went by it, you can understand that any er slight error in that rate it's going to displace the magnetic field. So we don't quite know where the magnetic field is. I've tried to take pictures of the planet, tried to uh, track down exactly where the magnetic pole was by looking for the aurora, but we haven't had much luck there. We actually went down and used Palomar to try to do that. Um, the other thing is that the radiation belts clearly interact with the moons of Uranus and they make big bite outs. Uh, in John Cooper, you can see his papers on it where it shows a lot of the bite out of, from the moons. This gives you an illustration at the top from Fran Baganel's work of roughly how, it, how the spin axis and the magnetic field interact. And you can see it's almost a complete, it's, it, well, it is a complete reversal as you turn from uh, in the 17 hour period. On the lower left is our fit to Kinerny's called Q3 magnetic field model. And we got a very good fit to that when we, when we did a few adjustments. By that, I mean that it turned out that the data we had, from the PDS and the data that we had from the JPL SPICE uh, database were frankly screwed up. And we had to jockey around with the, uh, whether it was east longitude or west longitude that they were reporting, which turned out to be wrong. And we finally got, if you look at the lower right figure, uh, the red line and the green line uh, we finally managed to get things to sync up pretty well by making some uh, reversals in the assumptions that the people pub that published the data had. This shows you the, uh, it reminds you of what the moons were. Miranda, of course, is, is enclosed in Ariel, Umbral, Titania, and Oberon. And this, whoops, sorry, went too far. This is just a sample of the data. Most of the data was taken at about four minute resolution. That's both the magnetic field, the particle data, 
and uh, detectors. And it took place in about, as you can see from here, a bit from 1300 to 2200 hours. It gives you about nine hours of the data at about four minutes resolution. And you can see the bite out from each of the moons there. You can see Umbriel, Ariel, and Miranda. You can see the uh, cutouts. Now, let me get into the development. We had basically two, three databases. We had the magnetic field, which I've already briefly discussed, where Kinerny went through and uh, fit the data with what's called the Q3 model. And we also, there's other models that we also use. We tried uh, simple dipole. And you, when you get to Insu's presentation, you'll see that you have access to both the dipole model and the Q3 model if you want to use either one. Uh, that to fit the data. Dipole is obviously much easier and simpler to use. As you can see here, this is the data from Selesnik and Stone in 1991, where they fit the Voyager 2 Cosmic Ray Telescope, the TET, fluxes between 0.7 and 2.5 MeV. That turns out to be important because the electron fluxes from the APL detector uh, were at lower energies, as you'll see in, in the next few graphs. Unfortunately, because of the weirdness of the magnetosphere, we only record to about 0.5 L. And uh, of course, people are probably going to want to go in closer to that. But I'll show you how we might be able to uh, at least uh, make some guesses as to how far in we can propagate the model. Anyway, again, it's four minute resolution, and we used, along with Selesnik and Stone, the Q3 magnetic field model. They fit the data as shown with this equation, where the differential flux is equal to a constant times the a power loss spectrum over the 0.7 to 2.5 MeV range. And they used, a, they determined N up here for the sign to the 2N of the pitch angle distributions. Down, going down, you can see the standard equations for, adi for the Louisville's theorem and uh, the adiabatic constants that we used in there from their paper. Now, I want to warn you another problem that we had. Uh, you, this is our plot of their contour plot. It reproduces it exactly. Unfortunately, we had to divide by 4 pi. We believe that they left off the four pi for this plot. We were able to reproduce all their other data when they made that assumption. So we think that the, the plot had, was missing a stair radians in it. So again, you have to be very careful when you use this data. Now, this is the data from the APL, uh, LECP, the uh, low energy charge particle detector. It went from 22 keV up to 1.2 MeV for the electrons. And you can see that we're able to get a little bit more out of it by including the uh, Caltech data uh, from Voyager 2. The protons were measured from 28 keV up to 3.5 MeV. We normally like to go up to 10 MeV, but that's, you get what you get as you, you, you realize. Down below, you can see the different uh, energy channels. And you can see the geometric factors and stuff from there, from Barry Mock's paper in 1987. Uh, we use that data as you'll see in, this, in a minute. Now, this is the big, the big issue. Uh, APL published the pitch angle distributions at 10, at 10 positions. And we decided in trying to fit the model, what we would do is we would use the, those pitch angle distributions and those spectra at those locations and then we would interpolate logarithmically between the data to do the model. That was the simplest and cleanest way to do it. So we have pitch angle distributions that we fit as are shown here. Some of them obviously aren't too good, but most of them are very good. And so we were able to use that data. If you look down at the, their figure 13, you can see where each of the uh, data points were taken. And they started about 15 L and go into, as I said, about four, 4.5 L for the uh, different measurements. So we use the spectrums at these locations. We linearly interpolated the logarithms between those points, given that we had the pitch angle distributions at these points. So this, of course, is the, is the big equation that you have to solve. 
uh, you to get the omnidirectional intensities, which we use for the radiation calculations, which was the point of this exercise, which is to develop a radiation model for Uranus that we could count on for doing our mission planning. And as you can see, it's standard breakout. You get the uh, differential flux as a function of energy and pitch angle. You get the pitch angle distribution function to integrate over and you can follow it. We broke the uh, pitch angle distribution function up into sine two to the n alpha, since that's the standard way that uh, most people do it. If you remember the equations at the beginning. So any questions on the equation? I think everybody realized that's the standard equation at that location, given the pitch angle distribution, you can determine the uh, flux, the omnidirectional flux. So to repeat, these are the steps. We define as a function of L shell, B location, B equator, and the uh, B critical at the top of the atmosphere. So we only integrate up to where the particles that were absorbed in the atmosphere occur. Were, were lost and use the Q3 magnetic field model with the corrections. Uh, I'm going to give you the paper, the paper if you from JPL, you can get it online uh, from JPL, or you can ask Jody for it um, that describes the uh, all the corrections and things that we did. So we would take and determine two L shells that bracketed the location we were interested in. And then we would compute the energy spectrum at the location using Mach and Selesnik uh, stone uh, data that were published. And then we would do, we move things down to the magnetic equator, of course, and apply the correction factors that we needed and got the pitch angle distributions. Then we defined the normalized pitch angle variation. Then we integrated for both locations to get the differential flux at both locations. And then we logarithmically interpolated between those points. And if the integral is desired, uh, the model also produces the, uh, does a number of higher energies and you can get an integral flux as opposed to the differential flux. That's the way the model works. So here are some examples. Uh, basically what we did, we fit the uh, data either from, for the electrons, for the APL data and the uh, Caltech data as shown on the left over here at time 13, 14 hours. Or for the protons, we just we only had available, of course, the uh, uh, APL data. And that only went up to, as, as I said before, up to about 3, 3.5 MeV. So here you can see the fits. I used the upper, <coughs> excuse me. I used the upper uh, equation to fit the data. And we got pretty good fits for most of it for the, for the 10 uh, points that we used in the model. Hmm. Uh, this gives you a comparison, but and top figure shows the L shell variation for uh, energy of 0.143 MeV for the electrons <clears throat> for the in and out uh, passage of this vehicle, and on voyage for Voyager two. And the bottom one gives you the uh, fluxes uh, versus time. So you've got L shell at the top for the electrons and. You, the green line is our model fit to that. On the right is for the protons. You see it didn't quite fit as well because of some of the bite outs were a little bit more significant for the protons than they were for the electrons. But you can see, I think that we did a very good job. I have the statistics in the paper and we got typically a point, point 0.8 to point 0.9 correlation coefficients for in and out uh, data, which I think was pretty good. So that's basically what the model returns. It returns the flux as a function of L shell and time as you go in and a function of the Q3 magnetic field model. Now, this is an inner comparison of all of the uh, different uh, models that we have online for you to use uh, that, that Ensu will be talking about. You can see Uranus and Neptune on the right over there. And you can get some, you can see that Uranus and Neptune are pretty well down from Jupiter, obviously, even from the Earth. And Saturn is, Saturn, as you know, wasn't a particular concern for radiation. And Uranus and Neptune appear to be even lower still by about an order of magnitude. 
Now, this is, the, this is the one that I unfortunately made the director of JPL nauseous for watching it. So if you watch this for a little while, hopefully you don't get too dizzy. <laughs> I've been told that it can make you ill. So on the upper left is the electrons for one MeV and on the right is the 2.5 MeV protons. And this shows you at during, basically during the Voyager flyby what we, uh, what we were, what we went through. And you can see it's really weird uh, the way the magnetic field changes and as a result the radiation belts vary. Oops, now they're getting out of phase. <laughs> I, they're supposed to be exactly synced, but unfortunately, there they go. So this is probably the most useful for you. Uh, what we're seeing here is the, uh, on the upper left is uh, at 10 MeV and 5 MeV, 5 MeV for, new, for Neptune and Uranus and 10 MeV for the other planets. You can see the function of L-shell, uh, the, the, the uh, differential flux, the, well, the integral flux uh, that we got for the, the, for the different models. And the interesting thing is if you trace the uh, blue line on the top, which is on the left for the electrons for Uranus, you can see it fairly well, except for where the lunar cutouts occur, follows the uh, same curve for all the other planets. In fact, it looks to, we published a paper, a paper on this and it gives you a pretty good notion that uh, except for Jupiter, most of the planets seem to fall along a rather normalized line. Yellow, of course, is the Earth and that might Give you some idea of what it might be internally and in Saturn. And the right is the protons. And again, it's fairly well uh, overlay each other. In fact, within a couple of uh, order of magnitude, it looks like they pretty much agree. Now, in the lower left is the total dose uh, for a flyby mission of these planets. And it gives you an idea of what we calculate for each of the flybys. And you can see again that the uh, dosage that you would get is fairly low and that it would, uh, that they seem to fairly well mimic each other. So in principle, uh, I wouldn't put too much faith in it. You can make a, get, make a guess of what the inner belt, radiation belt at Uranus might look like inside of four, given that it overlies, over, overlays pretty well with the uh, data from the other planets. So to begin my summary, uh, we've developed a comprehensive model of the Uranian radiation environment based on 10 points and the, uh, compared that with the actual data. And uh, if you review our paper, you'll see that the correlation was pretty good uh, for most of, the, most of the range. And again, it was only for like 20 hours that when we fly by. So the model is based on the BNL coordinates using the Q3 magnetic field model of Kinerny. The data was primarily from the Voyager CRS TET, that's the Caltech instrument, and from the low energy uh, uh, particle detector from APL. We didn't get any data within an L of four to five. So that's a limitation of the model and you need to take that into consideration. But again, if you compare it with the other planets, it does, uh, you could make some extrapolations. And I believe John Cooper did that uh, for uh, in one of his recent papers, I think came out about a year ago. Uh, the Uranian magnetic field model is very difficult and you have to be very careful in the coordinate systems that you use. We spent about uh, several months trying to decipher and finally came up with uh, excellent, what I believe were excellent fits to Kinerny's uh, maps and such by uh, making some very specific <laughs> assumptions about errors in the databases. Uh, by the way, the, um, <coughs> the LACP data is in the PDS and I talked with uh, Selesnik about it and, and he told me that he was gonna go ahead and put that in there too, but that was about a year or so ago. So you'll have to check and see if it's in the PDS also. So basically the big problem that you have is that it's a very complex magnetic field. We don't know if it's even in the same location now after all these years since, since the 80s 
and what basically almost 40 years later, well, actually we are 40 years later, we don't know exactly where the magnetic pole is and we don't know what the spin rate is within a couple hours, which means that uh, uh, that's, well, that's a problem that's gonna have to be addressed. I would suggest that the way to do it, I tried it, it wasn't, haven't been successful so far was to look for the aurora and see if you can figure out where the magnetic pole is and fall and track the auroral zone around and maybe get a better idea of where the magnetic pole is. So to summarize, and do my conclusion. Uh, the UMOD can be used to estimate between inside into about 4.5 L, the total dose versus shielding the single event upset environments due to protons and the IESD events from the uh, buried charge from the electrons. Uranus does have measurable radiation belts and they are comparable apparently to the other planets and uh, but just even if 100 mils, it looks to me like would cut down for a year mission, it would cut it down to below three kilorads, which uh, most parts are hardened to. The UMOD reference is given below. You can go online and find that. Uh, as I said, if not, you can contact Jody or you can contact INSU and uh, he'll be able to, pro to provide you a copy of the paper and uh, access to our model. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ensu. And uh... well, uh, so I'd like to uh, use this opportunity to some kind of discuss the what's the future uh, of the new mod, because the the the, the uranium mission that, that the NASA is planning to do is going under the the airshare equals four. So I think it was John Cooper kind of raised kind of an issue that question that we really don't know the environment less than L equals four. So one thing we've been uh, discussing with John and other other folks in the community that how we can expand, extend uh, the our model uh, below L equals four by using maybe uh, just physics-based model. So, so that's something that that's something we wants to uh, to address, uh, work on uh, in the future. So, and also if there, there is any idea that was missing from the UMAD and what what can be done for scientifically, and Hank has been focusing on the use of the UMAD for engineering purpose, but we wants to. Uh, also use UMAT uh, for some kind of scientific study. So is any idea, just contact us, uh, then we may be able to collaborate. So that's kind of a future that I see uh, related to the Uranian uh, radiation environment. And also we need to, we need to also account for the, the bite out by the moon, so absorption and uh, scattering by the moon. So. That's also something John Cooper and I've been talking about it too. So, and but Uranus mission is really far away, uh, depending on the budget situation. So, I don't know how 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 attractive this project <laughs> will be to the community, but uh, that's going to be something we need to uh, we want to work uh, down the road. And I think before we go on. Jody, do you want to take some any questions for Hank? Yeah, if there are any questions, we can um, we can definitely take them. Or if folks want to put them in the chat, uh, feel free to. Uh, or you can use the raise hand function. Um, uh, or we can also have like a discussion period at the end. I think anything okay. that you all, all want to do is uh, is totally fine. So uh, if if folks do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and we can we can get to them toward the end uh, if that's if that's what you all would like. Okay, then I don't, if, I, if we don't see any raised hand, then I can, I will go ahead. Sure, so, sure. Okay, so first of all, I, I, the, I copy, I provided the link to the website uh, that where the JPL, the Auto Planet Radiation Belt models are maintained, uh, being maintained uh, in, the, in the chat window. So there, and let's see. Okay, let me try to 
share my screen. Okay, do you see my screen? Yep. Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah, so you can get into the that website and you can click log in and then it'll lead to this this screen. So uh, I do have a I know because I do have an account, but if you don't have an account, you can you can this is publicly available website, so you can register, you can get the account. So this is open to to the anybody in the community who wants to use the our website. Uh, so I'm click I'm not a robot and then log in. Okay, so let's go to the uh it when you log in, the landing page will be your profile page, but you can go back to home page to select uh, many different options in the website. And as you can see in the top uh top portion of the uh, website, I, I'm hoping you can see my my cursor. Uh, we do have a uh, radiation environment models and, and atmosphere models for, for 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 solar system planet, and uh, we we do also have some the effect uh, tools that you can use to evaluate your your radiation radiation effect to to your material or device. It's very simple tools, and also we do maintain references here. So. For this particular presentation, uh, we are interested in the radiation environment for Uranus. So let's go through the, the radiation environment Uranus. So, okay. <clears throat> so number one, uh, uh, we need to have a trajectory uh, for your uh, for your mission, and the trajectory will be uh, converted into the BNL coordinate system by going through the the field tracing uh, uh, program, particle field tracing program. So it's called, so it's under the magnetic field. So you can go there and then you can, here you can, this is really self-explanatory and there is nothing really, uh, it, we try to, we try to provide enough uh, description uh, for users can, can read through and, and, and use the website uh, easily. So. Step one will be to prepare the trajectory file for uh, for your mission. So, and then once you get the trajectory file, you get the BNL coordinates. Step two will be going through the BNL system, BNL coordinate conversion, and then you just get the output from step two. Then that will be input to step three, where you can com you can compute, obtain the trapped radiation environment uh, estimate. So let's see. So. We we wanted to provide some kind of visualization of the orbit so that we can see the we can verify the orbit uh, by using uh, by by just looking at it. So uh, so we want to we recommend everyone to go through the orbit verification program. And okay, so I do have a uh, one example. Uh, I prepared uh, some examples test. So I'm going to use call you, so I have an input file, so it will be, it will be used. So you can just select, uh, click the orbit verification program uh, uh, button, and then it will give you some of the other explanation, background information too. So our, uh, at this time, uh, our input format is very, very strict. And you can see from here that it's very, uh, we are still we are still using Fortran and format statement. <laughs> so the format statement is really strict, uh, uh, hard programmed. Uh, so has to be has to follow the exact format statement. As you can as you can see here, and uh, this is kind of an input file format. So one of the things we want to do this year, this uh, down the, I mean this year is that we try we will want to have more flexible uh, user interface so that user can provide their their trajectory more easily. Uh, we don't they don't uh, they don't have to prepare exact the trajectory file format. Uh, they uh, based on based on our user experience, uh, people having a lot of trouble. 
to define the trajectory file with exactly the same format. Okay, so at this time, so uh, unfortunately, we have to do this, this very, very strict format, format input for trajectory input. So you can see that here that we do have a five uh, input variables. This is, this is all required uh, date and ephemeral time. Uh, this is not really used in the program, but this is something we want to have for the future use. And radial distance, uh, in a planet in, in terms of planetary radius and latitude and vast longitude. As I mentioned, input variables has to conform, most conform to the exact we specified. So this is something again, uh, we want to uh, make it more usable, more flexible down to, uh, uh, this, this year. Okay, so, so trajectory file is the first input uh, you, uh, you have to prepare. And then uh, we are going to collect, uh, also another thing is that the range coverage, coverage of the model is very strict too. So if you have a, uh, the the trajectory point uh, outside of this range, uh, it will give you error with uh, some kind of explanation. So another another point, another improvement we want to make this year is that again we want to move, we want to be more flexible, uh, not giving you error message, but give you some kind of a warning. Uh, we will provide some you know, warning messages, not error messages. Uh, just going through, I'm um, just running up and then go through the program without. Uh, terminating. So we are going to select Uranus and then file input. Uh, going, to, uh, uh, going to select this one, Uranus. And it went through our, the verification validation complete. And we're going to we're going to ask for plot of the trajectory. So you can see, you can see the trajectory of the our uh, mission, uh, the sample mission. So you can you can you can zoom in or you can zoom out, or you can see the trajectory how that the mission uh, goes through the the x y z uh, coordinate system. This is not BNR coordinate system. Uh, this is something you can just uh, just try to you want to visualize your tra trajectory. Uh, to make sure that your tra trajectory is not broken, something like that. Okay, so once you verify the trajectory, then we can uh, now run through the run through the magnet field models. So let's go through, go back, go back, relation environment, and magnetic field model, then we can run B field program. So given plan of B field code use the magnetic field lines tracing to compute the, the, the magnetic field vector location and BNL coordinates. Uh, so we need to go through this process. Again, same uh, same kind of a range coverage uh, limitation and then we can Uranus and click next. And then you can, again, the same trajectory file, we just verified uh, it's correct uh, through the visualization. Okay, we are, I'm going to collect like same. Again, we went through, uh, it's all good. So we can click next. Uh, sometimes, especially for, uh, for Jupiter, the B field uh, running time can be very long, depending on your your trajectory file size. Uh, for example, for Europa Clipper full mission trajectory, uh, it may took few hours or a few days uh, going through this B field pro uh, process. So what we implemented here is that. Uh, once you submit it, you can you are notified in your email that the run has been submitted, and the run has been, run, when run completed, then you you will get another another email notification that run has been completed. So you can go back. Uh, you can you don't have to wait in this website. So you can you, you have a uh, I have a, my email here so that they they will you know 
website will notify me when it's done. Anyway, I'm going to click next and submit. Then it's submitted. And this field output will be something like something, uh, the output file name will be B field output. So it will have uh, I pre run, so it will have this kind of information. Let's see the same date. Uh, just uh, ICT is just count and then not the count of count of the number of lines and then date, radius, uh, latitude, longitude. This is same input you provided, trajectory input, then that the BNL coordinate system uh, that has been compu computed by the B-field tracing program. So this is, the, this is the output that you will get corresponding to each trajectory point in your input file. And ZMAP uh, for Uranus is not being used. Uh, this is uh, something, this is for, especially for Jupiter. Of our our Jupiter our belt site uh, because we have we do have a flapping of the radiation model radiation environment uh, uh, in the greater than twenty RJ ish and we do have a model uh, that depend on the 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 height of the the your trajectory point in the magnetosphere. So this is the output from the B field program, and this will be made to input to. The radiation trapped radiation uh, uh, models. Again, yeah, so let's go down there. So that there are some options uh, for trapped particles. Then this is for Jupiter, and this is Saturn, this is Uranus, this is Neptune. So depending on your mission type, of course you you have you have a trajectory file for for each mission, and then you can for each each planet, a uh, different planet, and then you can select. The different models depend on your planet. Uh, in our case, uh, we do we are we are going to run UMAT uh, and select uh, file, and uh, you we need to select the B field output. Okay, and then uh, join to submit. You can see the radius uh, and the time uh, plot. Just for your, for your uh, information, and uh, okay, again, so it will be the output. This the so UMAT, Jayu, and Set Red, and NMAT. They all take a uh, shorter time than B field, but we want to just we want to you know we don't want we don't want hold hold you on the website uh, for some time. So again. When you when, once you submit uh, the the submission notification will be will be sent to your email and once the job is done then you will get another another email notification that job is done that you can come back and download your files and okay submit and then submit submit it so once it's done then you will get three different, uh, two different, let's see, task history. So I ran it on January 2nd. So you will get some flux files. I'm not sure whether we have it here or not. maybe next. Nope, nope. Anyway, you will get flux files uh, where you, you want to get clones information you know, Florence is the total total number of particles for your mission. Let's see, how can I get rid of this uh, zoom? And I'm trying to get rid of the zoom uh, bar. Uh, this is flow spectra uh, from 0 0.1, 0 0.1 MeV to 10 MeV for electron. Uh, and I, for for both for electron protons, and we provide inaugural flux and, and the differential flux. And also, you can get the point wise, point by point by point uh, spectrum. But this is too. 
so you can get the all the information uh, uh, for each energy uh, energy spectrum at each point. This is differential, and this is integral. So it will be used to understand how the environment now changes as a function of the time um, for your trajectory. So this is kind of a standard output for all models. So whether you run Jupiter model, Saturn model, uh, add Neptune model, uh, you will get these three different types of the, the output. So fluent spectra and differential spectra for each tra trajectory point and, and then integral, integral spectrum at the, each tra trajectory point. Okay, so this will be uh, this will be uh, for your use. So this is the output from the U mod, and uh, basically this is the where my my uh, demonstration uh, is ended. It's ending. So again, you can you can. For this particular Uranus model, uh, we have to go through, you have to have a trajectory and uh, you have to run through the, the B field tracing uh, program, so called B field magnetic field models. And then you have to run the trapped radiation model using the output from the B field tracing program uh, to, to obtain loans and uh, uh, flux spectra for your trajectory. Any questions? Uh, Again, I kind of recommend that you, if you don't have it yet, then you can get the account and then uh, we try out different models. For example, we do have a very simple planetary environment, uh, neutral atmosphere, ionosphere, and temperature profile for each uh, planet. Uh, you can click and then you can get the table, you can download and you can you, know, you can you can you can manipulate uh, whatever yeah whatever you want for atmosphere atmospheric models and also we do have uh, some effect models um, uh, for device application uh, there is some models out uh, so you can also obtain those steps uh, through this uh, website okay so any comment questions for both me and to Hank. Yeah, thank you so much for um, both Henry and Insu for giving that uh, overview of the model um, and bringing us through this website that looks really helpful to the community. Um, yeah, if anyone has a question, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll go through those. Um, we have about 10 minutes for discussion and then we'll go into a little bit of a community news update and uh, related to any ice giant systems goings on. Uh, while people are thinking about their questions, I'll go ahead and ask my question, uh, which is so, and Henry touched on this a little bit. Uh, you mentioned that it's a complex magnetic field um, there, it, it's, we're not sure if it's still in the same place as it was when we observed it with Voyager. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the next steps for updating the model, changing it? What kind of observations do we need and, and how are we gonna acquire those uh, observations in preparation for um, uh, Uranus probe? Well, I think that Insu touched on it in, in fairly good detail. Uh, and he's been working with John Cooper. And I, as I said, I think John published a paper recently on trying to extrapolate inwards uh, to determine what the missing uh, L uh, <laughs> values were in there. Uh, the, other, the other issue is that we do have observations from James Webb of uh, Uranus. And I'm not positive, but I believe that they can spot the uh, aurora and what I would what I tried to do with my students, and unfortunately we didn't. The instrument was down at the time on Palomar, was either in the UV or in the infrared. Uh, I believe you can see 
uh, traces of the aurora. And what you can then do is try to map over a period of time uh, where the aurora zone is and perhaps back out from that where we think the magnetic uh, pole is, poles are located on the, the planet. The other big thing is to know very accurately what the spin rate of the planet is. They, they're doing that now. They can, for the first time, they can see a lot better the clouds on Uranus and uh, perhaps map the uh, rotation rates. Uh, Sky and Telescope had some articles on amateurs trying to do that. Over, uh, I downloaded the papers on that, but again, they, they their values don't agree with uh, what the uh, Voyager got, the 17.24. I think they got 17 or 16 or something like that. So there's a real ambiguity in the spin rate. And I think that can be nailed down, hopefully with JWST and Hubble observations. So there should be a, a concentrated uh, attempt to do that, to get the spin rate right. And then additionally, look very carefully to see if you can find, if you can spot the aurora. And I believe you can. And from that, you can back out maybe where the magnetic pole is. That's, that would be my strong recommendations. Other than that, and the work that Ensu's talking about, uh, we're trying to extrapolate inwards, which I tried to give some examples of, I think you're pretty much data poor. Uh, the other thing that can be done is, um, and you might contact Ensu about this, is that try to get, read our paper on uh, getting, reconciling all the different data sets because everybody used different east and west longitude definitions. And I think that needs to be settled. And in part, that's because I think that the axis of Uranus went slightly past 90 degrees and the spin axis is backwards to what a lot of people think it is. So that's that would be my recommendations. Thanks, we have a question from Brian Palaszewski. Sorry for the pronunciation. Palaszewski. Palaszewski. That's very good. Yes, <laughs> delightful. Um, the trajectory you showed seemed to spiral rather than represent an orbit centered on the planet. Could you please explain the path of that trajectory? I think that was magnetic field coordinates as opposed to the actual, uh, what you call geographical coordinates. Yeah, the way uh, Insu described it, it would be, <clears throat> it seemed to be a mission trajectory. Um, so I, I always, I used to work at JPL, you know, I've only worked at NASA about 40 years or so. Uh, so when we talk about mission trajectories, it's usually a spacecraft trajectory passing the planet. That's why it was. I, uh, uh, even though I just mentioned, I uh, call it mission, it's just sample trajectory file we just generated. So when I say mission, it's just your mission trajectory. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the magnetic field. Yeah. Was to, and the magnetic field coordinates because that was a B field thing we were doing. Right. Yeah, and we can double check, but no, there's there's a lot of options you can you can visualize in the X Y Z coordinate or in the magnetic field coordinate in the website. I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah I appreciate the um, the clarification. Yeah, yeah thank you. All right. Any other questions? While we're waiting for that, uh, Jody, if you want to go ahead and put up the community news slide or sure. onto that. Yeah. And I actually have a question real quick too. Uh, so, so this is just kind of for personal interest, but in, so you showed at the beginning, uh, when you were demonstrating, um, the, the website that you could sort of sign in, is there, uh, restriction to who can sign in or is it like you just create account and you know or is it only for nasa gpl folks is it for everyone no it's for everyone in the world okay okay yeah so, so you, you can you, you like make an account and then, and then yeah, yeah yeah okay and probably you have to wait till the jpl folks come back to you you got approved but you know you just provide your affiliation and email and then anybody can use it cool awesome thanks um yeah i'll go ahead and, and pop the community news up on the uh, on the screen. Again, if anyone else has questions, definitely feel free to, to put them in the chat or, or raise your hand, uh, anything like that. Happy to um, kind of yield the floor for, for conversations. Um, but of course, again, thank you so much to, to Henry and Insu. Really great 
really great presentation, really great walkthrough too, to sort of help us learn how to use um, that, that tool. And I uh, certainly hope, and I assume it will be used uh, in the very, very near future as we all start to kind of plan for this really exciting uh, Uranus mission. Um, so let me, let me go ahead and put this. So at the end, uh, for folks who don't know, at the end of these, for in the last few minutes, uh, we just put up some community news to sort of uh, kind of make sure that people are staying involved and know what's happening in the community, um, you know, staying up to date on research positions or faculty positions, you know, things like that, and um, <clears throat> and other various meetings and conferences and, and uh, you know, in, in the community just to make sure we're kind of um, staying solidified as we maneuver this uh, this crazy world uh, getting getting excited for the for the Uranus orbiter and probe. So I'm going to put these links into the chat so that folks can um, actually click on them. Uh, so sorry for the huge the huge word dump <laughs> into the meeting chat, but at least now you can you can click on those links. Uh, so I'll just kind of quickly walk through these. so so next month, uh, February 3rd. So uh, every Ice Giant System seminar series is going to be the second Tuesday of every month uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so next month, we've got Tom Nordheim, uh, who's who's here at APL, uh, just started. So we're, we're, we're pretty stoked to kind of feature him. Uh, and then a couple, a couple uh, of sort of meeting notifications, meeting notices. There's a save the date exoplanets in our backyard. So I thought that might be kind of particularly uh, relevant to this community, um, so you can submit an indication of, of interest. Uh, and particularly exciting is openings on the OPEG committee. So you've got a couple weeks left still to kind of send a letter of interest in your CV and things like that uh, to that email address. So try to try to get onto that OPEG committee. It'll help make make some good changes. Uh, and then there's a few researcher positions and associate professor positions at the University of Oslo. The, specifically the Center for Planetary Habitability. Um, so that's pretty neat. And then the University of Central Florida also has an assistant or associate professor position. So all of these are kind of planetary related uh, positions that I think this, this crowd might be interested in. And of course, uh, for your early career folks, there's NASA the postdoctoral program uh, fellowships. I think they've got three deadlines throughout the year, something like that. And so one of them is coming up in the next couple of months, March 1st. So you can look at the opportunities that are available uh, at that website there. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is uh, sort of a standing slide in this little deck, which is the Uranus flagship workshop. Uh, so Uranus flagship investigating new paradigms for outer planet exploration. So this is going to be taking place at Goddard Space Flight Center uh, here on the East Coast in May. Um, and we're pretty excited to um, to kind of be co-hosting that APL and, and Goddard. And I'll put this link also in the chat. I don't think it was on the previous page. So just in case I'll kind of add that there. Um, and so I, I, I believe that uh, that it's just an indication of interest right now, I think. Um, and so, you know, hopefully the abstract submissions will open up and registration and things like that in the next uh, month or so. Um, so I think, I think that's everything from me. Um, I can turn it back over to Mallory if you have any kind of closing remarks, but again, I'll just say thank you so much to Henry and Insu. Really, really amazing uh, presentation and kind of walkthrough of the model. So really exciting stuff to see that uh, happening over there at GPL. So thanks. Yeah, yeah thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, Definitely. let's yeah, keep in touch. Yeah. All right, if anyone, if no one has any other questions, then I'll give you a few minutes back. All right. Take care, everyone. Okay. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you.